Welcome to our 23rd annual Writers' Symposium by the Sea at Point Loma Nazarene University. I'm Dean Nelson. I'm the journalism faculty at the university, and it's a great privilege to have Kareem Abdul-Jabbar with us this evening. He has two new books, Becoming Kareem, written for younger readers, Coach Wooden and Me. Both of those uh, became instant bestsellers. Writings on the Wall, where he discusses many social issues. Uh, Black Profiles in Courage, uh, a, a book about Mycroft Holmes, uh, Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes' brother, uh, On the Shoulders of Giants, about the Harlem Renaissance, and several others. Children's books, novels, collections of essays, uh, memoir, he can, do, he can do it all. His columns have attracted a great deal of attention. He writes for The Hollywood Reporter, The Guardian, has written for The Washington Post, Time Magazine, The New York Times. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, it is an honor to have you at our Writers' Symposium tonight. Thank you very much, and it's, it's great to be here. So I, I, have, I have so many favorite lines from your book, uh, Writings on the Wall. Uh, I've read all your other ones, but I gotta tell you, that one is my favorite. But here's, here's one, one line that just uh, stood out to me, where you say, during my five decades as a writer, I also played some basketball. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you started this when you were a teenager, right? You started writing? Actually, I started when I was in grade school. I, so what was it? I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it, and then you know the nuns would send me to uh, participate uh, for our school in essay contests. I never won anything, but I was the best of all the kids they had. I, I did it the best, um, so they, they would send me, so I went to uh, maybe two or three of those. But I, I just enjoyed it. It just seemed like uh, the, the writer part of you crystallized uh, from what I, was, of, uh, what I was reading of your, of your work. The writer part of you crystallized when you were a teenager and you were covering an event where Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, was, and you got to ask him a question. Yeah, I did get to ask him a question, and um, it, was, it, it, it all worked because, um, uh, you know, the, the question that I asked him related to the program I was taking part in. It was a mentoring program that was trying to show the kids in Harlem how to make Harlem a better place. You were writing for a newspaper, wasn't it? Put out by uh, young people? Oh, no, I, I, Dr. King was addressing the attendants of the program I was involved in. I was involved in a program that uh, uh, it mentored kids in Harlem and uh, challenged them to make Harlem a better place using whatever it was you know, in, in their uh, makeup that interested them. So I, you know, I was interested in writing. I, I was in a journalism workshop. They had a dance workshop, photography. Uh, we had a band. Uh, we had... Um, uh, people doing uh, community work, social work, uh, and it was it was really interesting. And um, the uh, program was started by Dr. John Henry Clark, and uh, he thought that it would help the kids in Harlem. So um, Dr. King, when he addressed us, he had all of the um, the national news uh, organizations followed him because he he had been named Man of the Year the year before in 1963. So uh, I got, they gave me um, press credentials and I covered the event with the press corps that was uh, following Dr. King. You know, all of the real press people, you know, CBS and mm -hmm. uh, Reuters and New York Times and people like that who were following Dr. King everywhere he went. And you were part of that group? For, I was part of that group for uh, about three or four hours. <laughs> <laughs> But it was amazing, you know, it gave me uh, an idea of, uh, you know, what, what it was like to, to do that. I think really the, uh, the place where I figured that I actually could write had more to do with going to UCLA. Um, I had a teacher, his name was uh, Lindstrom. In fact, he lives down here in San Diego now. But uh, Mr. Lindstrom uh, based our grades on a, our, our final essay of the, of the, uh, of the quarter. And he said he was going to read the three best essays and then give us our, our grades. And I was like waiting and waiting. I was like, when's he going to be finished? 
And then he read my essay. As he read your essay in class? In class as the best one. And I was like, wow. That had to feel pretty cool. Yeah, it made me feel very cool. I was like, maybe I could write, you know. Hmm. But of course, uh, you know, I had, um, had an NBA career to, to deal with between <laughs> that point and, and finally getting the opportunity to write. But What was it about? Um, the essay was about me <clears throat> meeting a friend of mine and going to a jazz club. It was the Village Vanguard, wasn't it? Yeah. How'd you know? Dude, I do my research. Oh, you must have, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I read it, and people, it was funny, a after the class let out, people were, well, well, what happened? Who'd you see that night? And stuff. So, you know, I, it struck me that maybe I, I could write, but um, I had a, had a few things to do with, uh, with hoops between then and when I actually did start to write after my NBA career was over. Do you ever think about what your life would have been like if you had gone into journalism instead? You could have, you could have actually been somebody. <laughs> Maybe, you, we'll, we'll never know, you know? No, no, I'm, you're, gonna, you're gonna drive home just regretting that decision to go into basketball. So, but you continue this thought by saying that as a writer, you, you wanted to do two things. You saw that writers could, could share stories of achievement, and this is what you did after your basketball career, um, a, a achievement of African Americans to provide role models uh, for readers that went beyond the stereotypes. But as a basketball player, you said that you could also then be a role model. I, th I think it's a pretty cool thing that you're now both. Yeah, it worked out okay. Um, <laughs> but you never know how that, that, that's gonna play out. You know, look, what, look at what happened to Charles Barkley. You know? well, <laughs> <laughs> He'll be, uh, Charles will be at next year's Writers' Symposium. <laughs> but the, the, okay, so, so let's talk about some of the stories that you've written. I, I love the On the Shoulders of Giants because the Harlem Renaissance, you tell these fantastic stories about the people who really shaped what was happening then and, and then what was the, um, the precursor of what was to come. But you also write about a tank battalion from World War II that was, uh, that was primarily staffed by African Americans, uh, inventors who are black, and can I just say that the children's book that you did about inventors, where the kids were named Ella and Herbie, nice little toss to the, uh, to the jazz fan in you, right? That was, that was some product placement for your jazz stuff, right? Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. so it, it was a beautiful book, but, um, and I, and I know everybody wants to talk to you about the Coach Wooden book, but I want to stick with writings on the wall just, just for a minute. Because you take on some really, really important social issues in that book. Uh, and what I loved about it is that you explain the complexity of those issues. You explain the complexity of, of um, politics and racism and religion, gender, class struggle, sports, news media, aging, and you have this letter to the next generation, but you do it with just sub, such depth and courage and risk. So my question is, when you wrote that, what did you want the audience to get out of that? Because I just told you what I got out of it. Well, I, I wanted the audience to uh, get an idea of how we could come together as in communities. All our communities could come together. We, we don't have to come together as uh, a Hispanic community, or an Irish community over there, or a black community here, or an Italian community there, we can come together as all the people in such and such county that love America and want to see it be a better place. I mean, that should be the, the basis for our, the, the final basis for our communication. The fact that we all want America to be a better place, and we all want better lives for ourselves and our children. That, that's, uh, that's an easy one to, to discuss. <laughs> I, I think, really, that's what the uh, Founding Fathers were talking about uh, when they were, were uh, envisioning what America would become. So we're, we're, do, now that you've 
written the book, I think it came out in 2016. Are there some other um, chapters, a 2018 version that you would add to that list that I just gave? Well, you know, we've, we've had uh, an election and it, you know, a radical change in the political environment, but uh, the ideals of our nation and uh, what the founding fathers were all about, I don't think that's changed that much. And I hope that uh, we can keep our sight on that because there are people that are trying to distract us from that and get us to uh, dislike each other. And uh, that, that's, that's not good for the individual and it's not good for our nation. So I hope that that changes. Yeah, yeah. So here's my other favorite line from that book. You ready? Sometimes when I look back at myself as a young man and the smug opinions I held, I'd like to hop in a time machine and go back and kick my own ass. <laughs> Absolutely. So what were, the, what were the smug opinions that you'd like to maybe uh, recalibrate? Jeez, there's so many of them. I, 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 <laughs> I wouldn't know where to start, but just, you know, the, the Well, you were speaking specifically about, uh, about uh, women's rights, I think, in that context. Oh, yeah, you know, and uh, my own thought of the, the ideal mate, you know, it, it's, it's changed a lot, <laughs> an awful lot, you know. But just the, the, the fact that um, we have to go through so much to achieve some wisdom. I think that's, that's, really, uh, that's really what I was trying to point out in that book. Uh, we, we really need to uh, take the time to do it the right way. And um, we have to make some mistakes in order to figure that out. So you're not saying don't have your opinions, don't, don't have your strong ideas. No, you can have uh, your opinions and your strong ideas, but don't hold on to them when they're obviously, they, they don't work. Hmm. There's, there's too many of them that, that don't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, well, so, so let's, let's talk about your, uh, your conversion to Islam uh, and changing your name. Because, I'm, again, I'm, I'm just intrigued by the, the way literature or reading has affected you. It, w it was really the, the inciting incident for you was reading a book, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, reading uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X and, and learning about Islam and then uh, going back and studying the history of uh, the slave trade and the Catholic Church and various, uh, various Islamic entities. You, you get a better perspective on, on what really happened. In fact, we have one of your classmates from one of your literature classes who's in the audience tonight who said that what she remembers about you is that you sat and read the autobiography of Malcolm X while, uh, during class. Yeah, I, I would do that sometime. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I would read all my textbooks as soon as I could so I didn't have to read them you know, over a period of 10 weeks or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's so boring, you know, so. <laughs> So I just read them all at once, you know. <laughs> but as far as your conversion uh, to Islam, you felt like you had to keep it a secret for a while. Why, well, I had why to see what that? it meant. You know, I, I had to understand what it meant. And uh, what I found out was that Islam is basically just the same. It's the, the very last update of the monotheism that was uh, uh, revealed to Moses and Noah and David and Jesus. Uh, all, it's the same monotheism. It, it, it really hasn't changed. It's just been updated. So uh, I, I don't have to have any antagonism toward any other faith. I just have to understand what the latest message was and try to, try to be true to it. But you, felt, but you couldn't talk about it yet. No, I, I didn't understand enough at that point. But uh, as you live your life and learn things, uh, it, it gets to be a lot easier. So you've got this, you describe this scene on a team bus that I think is so beautiful of uh, you guys all get talking about religion on, uh, on the bus. And you've got somebody talking about his Jewish faith, you have a, a fundamentalist Christian in there, and you tell them what has just happened uh, with you. Yeah. Can, can you describe that scene for us? Because I, I actually want to go somewhere with it. Yeah, well, it was uh, kind of surprising to my teammates because they didn't know what was going on in my head, and I, I told them I was interested in Islam, and I, I had 
really figured out that, you know, I wanted to be Muslim and live my life that way. And uh, they were very curious about it. Coach Wooden was curious. And kind of, he kind of entered the conversation and kind of moderated it with, without trying to dominate it or anything. He just wanted to hear what we had to say and make sure everybody got a chance to uh, speak. But it really brought us all closer together because, uh, you know, we didn't really have any any uh, raging differences. Uh, we, we just wanted to uh, play hoops and uh, mm -hmm. win the NC2A tournament. And uh, if we could do that, we were all happy. And I, I didn't care what religion they were, you know? Yeah. But th th here's, here's why I thought that was such a profound scene, because it just struck me as, um, as kind of this microcosm of what it could be and what it should be when we talk about our religious differences. This is one of the reasons why I loved reading this book because I just thought, you know, if you extrapolate from that the big picture, that could happen on a bigger scale, don't you think? Yeah, it happens all the time. Uh, it's been happening. You know, all of this uh, attempts to uh, marginalize Muslims has forced Muslims to reach out and um, a whole lot of people from other religious communities want to know what's going on. So we, we've had a whole lot of uh, exploration and contact between different religious groups that never would have uh, occurred if it had not been for the divisive nature of the, uh, of the Trump administration. And uh, people are starting to find out who their neighbors are, which is the most important aspect of all of them. When, when we talk to our neighbors and find out who they are and, and, what, their, and what their needs and hopes are, uh, we will see in them a reflection of our own needs and wants, and we can help each other. And that's what, that's what it's all about. That's what uh, Jesus was talking about. That's what Moses spoke of, Abraham, the prophet Muhammad, all of them spoke of the same uh, set of circumstances, and that uh, we should treat each other as we ourselves wish to be treated. I'm, uh, yeah, I mean, it seems so obvious, yeah. right? It, it, it seems so obvious, and yet there's, there's some fear of getting to know your neighbor at the level you're talking about. Yeah, so what's holding, uh, uh, present uh, administration aside, what, what keeps us from doing this? The fear usually is just uh, they don't look exactly like you look. <laughs> they don't uh, have the same cultural background. Um, they come from a, a different part of the planet. It doesn't mean too much. Uh, the only people on the planet are homo sapiens. Uh, we, we have quite a variety of skin color and hair texture and uh, eye color. But other than that, we're all human beings and we gotta treat each other that way. So even, so here's another metaphor out of your Coach Wooden book that I, I, I just think is, is so awesome. So your relationship with him, which is that, what that book is really about friendship and, and seeing past your differences. But here's a short, white, Midwest, old-fashioned guy who's, who quotes old poets. And, uh, and then there's you and your friends, and, and, and then you two become friends. Yeah. The, you see the metaphor I'm after there too, which is, Look at how you could not have been more different. Across generations, you know, the, the, just the difference in age was so radical. But actually, Coach and I had a lot that we were absolutely simpatico on, and that would be hoops, uh, jazz music, although Coach Wooden's idea on jazz music was a little bit earlier than mine. <laughs> I can tell you a story about Coach Wooden that it's very hard for people to believe. Please. Coach Wooden played for a professional team in uh, Indianapolis, the Kautsky team. Mr. Kautsky owned several uh, uh, butcher shops and grocery stores around Indianapolis, and he loved professional basketball, and he sponsored a team. And Coach Wooden played for the Kautsky team in Indianapolis. They would play the Globetrotters, so. Seriously, was it yeah. all short white guys? No, 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 it wasn't all short white, and it was really good basketball players. Kowski had a good team. Huh. They played the Globetrotters in um, Chicago at the Chicago Savoy. And Coach Wooden said, you know, he said, you know, usually after the game, I'd take Nell and go get on the train, get back to Indianapolis on the last train leaving Chicago. He said, but 
the, this night we played this game, I, we, we couldn't leave that night. The food was wonderful, and they had Cab Calloway's band. So, you know, that means that Coach Wooden at 3 in the morning, 2 or 3 in the morning, was with Cab Calloway and a lot of black people on the south side of Chicago going, hidey high, hidey ho. <laughs> it's hard to imagine. That, that, to me, is totally incompatible with what I know about Coach Wooden. Yeah. But w what I came to find out was, yeah, that, that would pro he probably would have did that because it was a great experience for him. And... Um, he uh, he liked uh, he liked jazz. He he when he and Nell got married, they uh, they went to see the uh, Mills Brothers. That that uh, that weekend uh, that they got married. That's pretty cool. It was. So you said he was also a literary influence on you. I oh, mean, yeah. you were influenced by James Baldwin or Neil Hurston. Uh, well, Malcolm just the X. fact that uh, Coach Wooden uh, loved poetry. He, he loved the. Uh, the classic uh, English poets, uh, you know, Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Shakespeare and, you know, Robert Frost and people like that. And he could quote them. He'd quote really long poems from them. Uh, so he, he, was, uh, he was all over the place with, with his uh, discipline and his interests. You've got some pretty wide interests, too. And so in addition to jazz and to literature, you've, you've also been really clear about your love for history. Yeah. Um, as a student, though, I think maybe probably primarily middle school or, or high school, you were surprised by how few African-Americans appeared in any textbooks. There were no African-Americans in my textbook. I didn't see any. I didn't find out about Af African-Americans as historical people uh, that did something significant in the United States until I attended UCLA and started taking black history classes. And that's when I found out about the black cowboys and the Buffalo soldiers and uh, uh, Salem, uh, Peter Salem at the Battle of Bunker Hill and uh, other Muslims that uh, help, help us achieve our independence. Um, none of that is, is written in our history books. Uh, the fact that Dr. Charles Drew uh, figured out blood typing uh, blood typing has enabled us to cure and uh, anal analyze and uh, identify so many conditions that have been uh, treated. And it all started with uh, blood typing. Th those of you who went for your marriage license and made sure that you and your partner would not be incompatible and have uh, children with birth defects, that was Dr. Charles Drew who made that possible. Uh, a very important guy. And all we read about is George Washington Carver. I mean, that's it. Yeah. George Washington Carver in, in Frederick invented, Douglass invented peanut butter, which he didn't. But <laughs> you know, that, that's uh, that's all we we know about black inventors. <coughs> the light bulbs that we have, the incandescent light bulb, was made possible by the invention of of a, of a black. Uh, 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 scientists that worked for Mr. Edison. Edison took credit for it, but he didn't invent it. It was uh, Louis Latimer who put the carbon filaments in a, in a vacuum and put an electric current through it, and you get light, but it doesn't burn it, and the light bulb can last hundreds of hours instead of just a couple of dozen, dozen hours. And it made light bulbs a practical invention. And uh, that's when America started electrifying its, its cities and uh, electrifying its homes. So you take up this and say, I'm going to write about this battalion of, uh, of, of tank operators in World War II or the black profiles and courage that you wrote, um, what color is my world, um, th what you were just referring to, and then on the shoulders of giants. And I got to tell you, if you had written the history books that I read when I was in school, I would have done a lot better in history because they were really good. They're really, really interesting. Yeah, they are interesting. And everybody, everybody likes ice cream, right? And a black guy invented the ice cream scoop. <laughs> Potato chips. Yeah, you got to get it in the bowl. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so this, though, leads to, I think, why there is... Um, 
misunderstanding, we could even go as far as saying racism, because racism fundamentally is not understanding. Not understanding the contributions that people who don't share your ethnicity, uh, we have a tendency to look, up, look down on those people and say they're lazy and, and don't contribute anything. And uh, you know, black Americans, as, black Americans have contributed so much to what makes America great. And it, it really hurts me to see that that's not acknowledged. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was reading a profile on the, uh, the poet Kevin Young. He directs the Schomburg Center in, uh, for research in black culture in Harlem, a place that influenced you when, uh, uh, when you were young. He's also the new poetry editor of The, uh, of the New Yorker. And he, he said this, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, because I frankly, I don't understand it as a white guy, okay? So he said, the concept of race is one of the most consequential hoaxes in American history. At its root, race is nothing other than a fake thing pretending to be real. What does that mean? What he's talking about is the fact that um, in reality, all people are African. From what we know about the study of DNA, Homo sapiens left East Africa some couple hundred thousand years ago and spread across this planet. And in doing that and going into different environments, uh, Homo sapiens adapted. The Homo sapiens that stayed in Africa in the, in the equatorial region of the world, they got dark skin and curly hair that protected them in extreme uh, sunshine. People living in Northern Europe, uh, did a lot better with lighter skin because the lighter skin enabled them to absorb the sunshine, vitamin D, which is essential for human existence. So people living in Northern Europe became lighter. People living in China developed their racial characteristics. But we're all compatible. Um, an Irish guy can marry a Chinese woman and they can have a lot of kids. A black guy can marry an Irish woman and have a lot of kids. And we can, I can go on and just connect all different ethnicities. And they all seem to end up having a lot of kids. And uh, <laughs> it's all about male and female. It's not about what you look like. You know, you, that, that's it's, it's just a great variety, which is a bigger variety for all of us to choose from. Uh, we it's, should be happy about that. It's just hard to get my head around the idea of race being a hoax. It's a hoax because we're all compatible. Yeah. Uh, and you can... You and uh, a woman from Africa with almost jet black skin will have uh, children and they'll be right there in the middle. Mm -hmm. And they'll have some of your characteristics and some of her characteristics. And that's how, that's how human beings have gotten along and survived. It, it's uh, how the good Lord made us uh, able to, to uh, populate this planet. And uh, what does the Bible tell us? Uh, Procreate and uh, be fruitful and multiply. Be, be, be fruitful and multiply. Yeah, there you go. Everybody's going to go home tonight and think about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope so. <laughs> some some better only think about it. Yeah. So <laughs> so let's 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 talk about let's talk about your obsession with Sherlock Holmes here for a minute. So your Mycroft Holmes book is a great story. It's a, it's a great story, but it includes this main character. Just think about it. A black guy who has his roots in a Caribbean island and goes back and discovers some things. I'm not gonna spoil the, the plot for anybody who hasn't read it. But, um, uh, and this character is named Douglas, who is also the founder of the Harlem Wrens um, uh, basketball team. So I'm just seeing all these connections here did you have kind of fun? You're, you're obviously writing from some of your own well, well, history. Well, my, my family is from the island of Trinidad, and I just uh, thought that uh, so many Victorian novels focus on London, and they don't focus on the rest of the British Empire. Uh, at that time of Queen Victoria, uh, literally, the sun did not set on the, on the British Empire. At some time of day, the sun was shining on some place on the earth that Britain... Uh, controlled and dominated. So, um, you know, that, that really made me question how um, Dickens 
and other uh, Victorian authors would ignore people from China and people from Africa and Asia that were, had become part of the British Empire. They didn't deal with them. They only dealt with people from Great Britain. So uh, I, I wrote my novel looking at it from the other end of the telescope and uh, how people from the various parts of the British Empire related back to England. I thought it would be a, a, a good perspective and uh, I thought it would be interesting. And um, it did okay. I, I, I was shocked. You know, the people came over from London to interview me about, about this book. I was like, they must think it stinks. And it was, <laughs> it was the exact opposite. They thought it had, was, was well written and I, I was really flattered that uh, they would uh, take the time to uh, acknowledge it. No, it's a, it's, it's, a great, it's a great story. And there, there's one scene, though, that I want to ask you about where that character, who's very similar to you, the character in that novel, <laughs> punches out a government official for saying something demeaning about black people. And I'm just wondering, were you kind of working out a fantasy there where he just kind of punched this dude out? Uh, probably, uh, I probably wanted to do that dozens of times in my life. <laughs> but, I, you know, you have to, you can't, do that. But in those days, you could do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you got it kind of out of your system. So that I got way. it out of my system, you know, going back in time. <laughs> so do you have a preference? Uh, historical kinds of stuff? Writing novels? What? what? Oh, I, I like all of it. You know, I, I enjoyed Sherlock Holmes, uh, but I, I also enjoyed John le Carre. He's awesome. I read... Uh, in high school, we had to read uh, The Spy Who Came In From The Coal. Mm -hmm. and it's a great book. I was, I was addicted with that one. I've read every one that he's written since then. There's a stage production about your life that's in the works. Is that correct? Yeah. Tell us about it. Well, we're going to talk about my book. Uh, the Becoming Kareem book? Becoming Kareem book and, you know, what it was all about and how the mentors affected me, how I, what I learned from uh, Bruce Lee and what I might have learned from Count Basie, or what I might have learned from Coach Wooden, mm -hmm. or you know, all of the people that uh, got to influence my life. Uh, I got a chance to hang out and observe and you know, see Wilt Chamberlain's life. You know, wh while he was playing for the 76ers, he, uh, he lived in New York, and I'd, I'd see him all the time. So I got a chance to, to figure out what his lifestyle was all about. And, um, you know, figure out, it's, it's interesting. You learn from your mentors, some things you learn about are things that you should emulate, and some things you learn about your mentors you, you, you should know not to emulate. <laughs> so uh, it was a very, very useful process for me. I think it was during the Wilt Chamberlain time where you also got to hang out with Miles Davis, right? Uh, well, while I was in high school. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, got to, um, I got to see Miles while I was in high school, and it was interesting. I, I, I went to a, a, a concert in sp my freshman year at UCLA, and that's when I got to meet Miles. And um, Miles didn't, wasn't very friendly at all, right? Then two years later, I ran into him while I was in New York for the summer, and he was a big sports fan, and he... He knew who I was, and then all of a sudden I was like his best friend. He, <laughs> he made me come home. I, I had to go home with him. We, we watched fight films till like nine at night. You, you watched what? Fight films. With Miles With Davis. Miles. Miles liked the box. Yeah, I mean, that's where you first saw him, right? He was, wasn't he well, working out? He was out? working out at, yeah. in the gym, and Wilt was in there. I was with Wilt, but I, we'd see Miles in the corner boxing. But Miles was really into it. And my dad boxed. I knew a little bit about it. So we, you know, we started talking. He said, no, you got to come. And so we went to his house and watched spite films till, till nine. And I didn't get home. I was like, come, come on, man. <laughs> but he, Miles was a good guy, though. You know, he, he was down to earth. He, Miles actually told um, Sugar Ray Robinson lost the fight that he shouldn't have lost. And, you know, he just, he had lost his focus. And Miles was the first dude to tell him, uh, you, you got to retire now, man. I, I don't want to see you leave because, uh, you know, Sugar Ray Robinson was uh, uh, probably the most classy fighter that uh, America has known in, in terms of talent and uh, what he achieved. And Miles was giving him boxing advice? Yeah, right? 
<laughs> did, did he give that you was some? Like, that was as crazy as Sugar giving him uh, advice of, on how to play the trumpet, you know? Yeah, exactly. He didn't give you advice about your sky hook or something like that? Well, no, but you know what? He, he said he liked the way I played the game because he said, Wilt just dunks everything. He, he didn't like that. He said, you got a variety of shots and some finesse. He, li he liked seeing that. It's nice when your heroes look at you like that. You know, I was like, wow, Miles thinks I'm cool. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that, that would be pretty heady stuff. It was. Of I mean, course, the whole time I, want, I wanted to dress like Miles. Couldn't do that. I couldn't go downtown and have some really great tailor, you know, fit me out. But the desire was there. And you couldn't play basketball in sunglasses the no, way he would play. That would be awkward. I, I tried that, too. With sunglasses? Yeah, yeah, at the beach. It didn't work. <laughs> so you had to face, not too long ago, your own uh, mortality yeah. with a diagnosis of a form of leukemia. Yeah, I have uh, chronic uh, CM, CML leukemia. And then, uh, um, what was it, seven years after I was diagnosed with leukemia, I, I had to have uh, quadruple bypass surgery. And that was a, you know, I have one of my sons is a doctor, and he said, Dad, you don't, you know, you, you're lean, you exercise, you eat right, maybe you might need a stent. And I went in for uh, a cardiogram, and they took me out right away, 20 minutes. I was in and out, and I said, what's going on? They said, they told me, you have blockages of 100, 80, 80, and 60 percent. You're going to have quadruple bypass surgery in two days, which ended up being my birthday. Wow. So now I have two birthdays. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. But, but something like that marks you, doesn't it? D d there's, does that change you at all when you, when you have to face up to that, something like that? Yeah, of like course, that? because then you realize, uh, since you hadn't realized it up to that point, you start to realize that you're not going to be here forever. And the time you have left, you better prioritize it and do the right things for the right people, uh, the people that you love and respect. And you know, take care of all those things that have a high, um, hi high ranking on your to-do list because uh, you might not get to do it. Yeah. There's, there's a line when you've written about this that really resonated with me. It says, you wrote this, death is like an arranged marriage with someone you've never met but about whom you've heard unpleasant rumors. <laughs> That's right. It's one, it's one you want to avoid. It's like... You know, the bully in your neighborhood wants you to go out with his cousin, and you know what she looks like? <laughs> Death is like that? Yeah. You're not looking forward to that day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we try to rage, rage against the fading of the light. That, that's the best way to deal with it. Does it, uh, does it change anything about what you write about? Uh, it can if... if what you want to write about is related to those things. Has it Absolutely. changed anything you've written about? Uh, no, but it, it's changed you know, some of my focus, especially with, with my kids. I have a new granddaughter now, my first grandchild. You know, I start thinking about that. I start thinking about things that, uh, what things are going to be like if you're not here. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not a big if, it's a definite, you know, so you got to, you got to deal with that and uh, adjust, adjust the way you spend your time. Yeah. I'm sure you've been asked a million times about uh, the Coach Wooden snug and tug story, but here's, um, and, and, and we, you can tell it if you'd like, but, but he had a very particular way for everybody to put on their socks and for some very specific reasons. I'm just wondering if there's a snug and tug equivalent to writing, is is there are there some disciplines? Are there just yeah. some methods that you stick with? Coach Wooden uh, told us if we had blisters, we wouldn't be able to practice, and if we didn't practice, we wouldn't understand the game plan, and if we didn't understand understand the game plan, we weren't going to get playing time. So put your socks on correctly, without any creases in them, so you won't get blisters, and you'll be able to play. If Coach Wooden felt that you should play. So, so, uh, so is there an equivalent in writing, though? There is an equivalent. I, I think um, the, the worst part about writing is you have to rewrite everything. 
Every time you write something down, it's good, and it's good if you read it out loud, and then you'll see how absurd it sounds when you <laughs> read it out loud. And then you gotta go back and make it right and make sure it fits in with how you wanna explain all the things you're trying to explain in your story or uh, you know, whatever the type of book that you're trying to write, you know, that everything makes sense uh, and is a logical pro progression toward the end. You've got this great line about writing that I think is probably true of, of, of anything worthwhile where you say, talent only gets you so far, preparedness takes you the rest of the way. Yeah, you have to, you have to be prepared you, and you have to be ready to rewrite. You can't like just leave it to the editor or to you know, somebody else. You, you have to do it because you're the only one that understands what you're trying to say to, to the last letter. And you really need to uh, respect that. And uh, the, de the dedication to the, to the final uh, product is, should be what the hallmark is of, of, of your writing. You've also got this line where you say, your opponent now is your own laziness when it comes to writing. Yeah. I'm not talking about the rest of your life. I don't know anything about that. I'm just saying your inclination toward laziness when it comes to writing. What do you mean by that? Well, I, I think all writers are like that. Uh, a writer initially understands what he wants to convey, what he wants to say, uh, but he tries to say it in, in the fewest words, in the leanest possible way, because you, know, you don't want to write more words than you have to. It takes time and energy, and you can misspell words and have the grammar all messed up, and people will laugh at you um, if you, if you write that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, it's either one way or the other. You know, you got to really take time and be dedicated and uh, deal with the, all the fine print, all all the final uh, uh, little points that you have to uh, make sure are in the right place and expressing the right thing so that you, you can be understood. So that is the equivalent of the snug and tug, right? On the socks, if punctuation, uh, paying attention to details, those, those are the kinds of things. Right, and yeah, the, between yourself and your editor, you have to have all of those be right on the money. You can't, you can't screw around with that, or people won't read it. You know, People just yeah. say, yeah, this doesn't make sense. Uh, you, you can have your, um, be making your points in the wrong order and uh, mm -hmm. just confusing people rather than explaining things to them. So when you would read people like Langston Hughes or James Baldwin or uh, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, what was it about their writing that resonated with you? Well, I, I would uh, focus on um, James Baldwin. I, I couldn't understand, for, for me, the civil rights thing started with the murder of Emmett Till. I didn't understand why they murdered him. I asked my parents, they didn't have the words to explain it. So I was like, what is this all about? Why, why did they hate that boy so much? Why did they murder him? And um, I was in the eighth grade, I was 13 years old, and a friend gave me a copy of The Fire Next Time. And James Baldwin put it all out there logically. Uh, he didn't try to whitewash it. He, he put it out there logically and uh, carefully and speaking the truth, and then all of a sudden, I started to understand, and um, it, that that really motivated me to uh, do what I could to to change it. So, what are you what are you working on now besides the stage production? What uh, what has you motivated as a writer? Well, the uh, second Mycroft book is coming out in September, and I'll go on this tour with uh, Roy Firestone uh, in the fall also. Uh, we, talk about my life and uh, do some Q&A and uh, try to expose a few things about me that maybe people didn't understand or would like uh, some clarification on. So hopefully I'll have a good time uh, dealing with everybody and uh, answering questions and letting it all hang out. Cool. So, so what about, uh, you, you have worked with a co-writer on some of your, uh, some of your books yeah. or a co-author. Um, how does that work? What's the arrangement there? Well, um, he's talking about Raymond Abisel. Raymond will, will sometimes write a few things, some ideas. He'll send them to me and I'll give him notes. Or the opposite will happen. Mm -hmm. 
I'll have an idea about uh, a subject matter that we can get into, and I'll give him my thoughts, he'll give me notes, and then we go back and forth, um, writer and editor. Okay. So, uh, since this is a writer's symposium, a lot of people in the audience and a lot of people who will be watching this are writers and they're interested in that topic. Do you have some advice for them? Yeah. You gotta be ready and willing to rewrite. Uh, it's, it's all about rewrite. You, you gotta have, it, have all the pieces in place and it, it won't seem correct to you until you read it all and understand it and it makes sense. And that's gonna take several rewrites. So you gotta be ready to do that. That's, that's why you hear about people saying, it took me 11 years to write my memoirs. I can, I can understand that, you know? And the more complicated your life is, the, the more time that's gonna take. But uh, the more able you are to uh, understand that and have the patience to, uh, to keep it organized, uh, that really helps, uh, helps you communicate your, your ideas and uh, people will appreciate it. So, so let me close with this. I've got a, uh, a line from your Becoming Kareem book uh, that I want you to apply to writing. Okay, I think you were talking about uh, uh, basketball, but I, I want you to apply it to writing. You've got this statement that says, my power wasn't in being a great player, but in loving something enough to work hard at being better. Right, so it wasn't just about being a great player. You, there was something about the desire. How, oh, does, yeah. that, how does that apply to writing too? Well, if, if you want to, uh, to write and you have a good story, if you put it down coherently, people will appreciate it. If you don't, people will say, you need to keep working on that, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. But uh, the whole idea is to, to have a good idea of how things look when they're, when they're done well, when they're written well. And, uh, you know, for all of the people that I've enjoyed reading their stuff, it, there's also a little bit of plagiarism going on in there because I'm learning every time I read what they write, you know, and how, how they set up their, their uh, different aspects of the story and how they make their points, uh, what to do to surprise the reader and, uh, you know, challenge them. We don't call it plagiarism, we call it borrowing. When, uh, right, right, plagiarism, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, give us one final word about writing, and then we're out. Uh, it's wonderful, but it's, it's tedious. It's like um, having a child, you know? Uh, d don't you love it when guys say that? It's the, only, it's the only kind of child I can have, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I appreciate it, and I'm, I'm glad that I've, uh, I've had a couple that, that people have liked. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, thank you so much for being with us. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.